Jackie, when you see the election of, um, of 2016, the election of President Trump, I mean, people talk about how he promised all these things and um, what they forget, and it's, it's easy to understand why it's forgotten, but candidate Trump was the most anti-Wall Street candidate in the United States since FDR. Mm -hmm. He pilloried Clinton for being the candidate of Wall Street. He, his ads all over the place were, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs is going to run Washington if you elect Hillary Clinton. And the con job was President Trump has never met candidate Trump. I'm here this afternoon with Dennis Kelleher, the leader of Better Markets in Washington, D.C. Dennis has done a tremendous amount of work, first as a private attorney, then working in the United States Congress, particularly at the time of Dodd-Frank, and now runs Better Markets that he and Mike Masters founded in uh, fighting the good fight on financial markets. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. When you work in senior positions, as you know, Rob, in the Senate, um, when you, even when you're in those positions, and certainly when you're thinking of leaving them, there's all sorts of uh, offers that come your way with, uh, nowadays, millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the big problems we have in this country. It's called the revolving door, where people in so-called public service frequently just monetize that public service by leaving the, whatever position they're in selling themselves to the highest bidder, which nowadays, frankly, is the pharmaceutical companies, Wall Street, defense companies, who have an iron lock on tilting Washington policy making to advantage them, mm -hmm. and frankly, disadvantage everybody else. Now, it may not be their intent to disadvantage everybody else, but it certainly is the intent to advantage them. Having this, is, this is problematic as well, not just because they leave after the fact to use their expertise to confer advantage, People, while working on Senate and House staff, know that someday that might be where they go, and they start to potentially be influenced in performing public policy when they're on the salary of the taxpayer. Well, you know, Abramoff, there was this big scandal with Abramoff uh, several years ago, and he went to jail for about 18 months uh, effect for effectively bribing politicians. He wrote a book afterwards, and the, one of the lines in the book was, he said when he was you know, a lobbyist, and he would go up to the hill and he would talk to staff. One of his favorite lines is he would say, don't forget, when you leave, give me a call. Right. And the line in the book was, from that moment on, I knew I owned them. Yes. And that's a, that's a bit of an overstatement. That's right. Um, you know, there's a lot of good people working in government. I worked with people who worked in government for literally for tens of years, decades, and many years, very public service spirited, work very hard under bad conditions and low pay, and do a great service to the American public. I remember it was, it was Kerry Parker that worked with Kerry Parker Kennedy. was, was with uh, Senator Kennedy Minnesota. for, yeah. I think, four decades. Yeah. Um, and he, he left uh, virtually as penniless as he walked in. Mm -hmm. And that's true for uh, many, many public servants who do a terrific job and end up with government pensions, which, notwithstanding what you read on the Internet, are not exactly very lucrative. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, there are those who are there setting themselves up for a future job and cashing in uh, and influence peddling. And there are those who don't have that intent when they're there, but when the huge dollars are dropped in their lap when they're walking out the door, mm -hmm. uh, they find it irresistible. And unfortunately, that's what really gives the private sector and private interest the edge. The edge in Washington is being connected to insiders, knowing what happens on the inside, and then making those connections after you're out of government on behalf of your current paymaster, mm -hmm. whoever that might be. And that just didn't have an appeal to me when I was leaving the Senate. I, I spent eight years in senior staff positions in the United States, almost eight years. Um, and I was looking for something to do that I thought was very challenging and worthwhile. And the two big challenges I really saw at the time, and it's a little bit interesting because it kind of overlaps with Steve's book, Tailspin, the two really big challenges were money in politics and campaign finance reform, and the other was financial reform. This is the, just after Dodd-Frank was passed in July of 2010, and there already were several groups in the uh, campaign finance reform space. There was no one in the financial reform space at the time. There was no one actually to provide a counterweight in the legal and policy-making process in Washington to the power, might, and money of Wall Street. And, and just for those who are not so familiar with the process, Dodd-Frank wasn't passed like a detailed recipe book. It was punted to committees of <laughs> rulemakers where the ongoing process you're describing, where there was no counterweight, 
uh, was what would what you might call flesh out what the bill was to become. Well, that's exactly right. You know, most big laws like Dodd-Frank are not self-executing. No matter how long the law might be, it really provides a framework. The way I talk about it is you think of it as a skeleton, but it has to be fleshed out. And it gets fleshed out in the regulatory agencies and ultimately in the courts. And uh, the financial industry, uh, with all its lobbyists and the revolving door and its campaign finance and all its purchased academics and influencers, are expert at playing uh, the rulemaking, policy-making process in Washington and, and, of course, all the army of lawyers in the subsequent litigation. And when Dodd-Frank was passed, a prominent uh, Wall Street lobbyist or the head of one of their trade groups, uh, a reporter said to him, boy, that's some defeat, the fact that a big financial reform law was passed. And he kind of laughed and he said, defeat? He said, this is halftime, baby. Correct. Now's when we go to work. Yeah. And what he meant was it now goes from a highly visible, highly covered uh, activity in the legislative process to the dark corners in the back rooms, -rooms. of the regulators. <laughs> and the regulators are at the SEC, the CFTC, the Fed, the OCC, the FD, places that nobody hears about, that you don't see in the papers, and that the nightly news does not cover, right? Because it's really the substantive detailed um, fighting over how the financial reform law was going to actually be implemented to either protect the American people or protect the profits of the financial industry. And at that, when I was leaving the Senate, the only thing, the only army on the field was the army to protect uh, the profits of the financial industry. So uh, myself and Mike Masters, who is a a, hedge fund, a successful hedge fund manager and very public spirited guy. He's, he's American from Atlanta, Georgia. He's from Atlanta, Atlanta Georgia. Yeah. Um, he believes in markets and he believes markets are some of the uh, best mechanisms in the world for prosperity, including broad based prosperity, but like everything else, they need guardrails. There needs to be rules of the road for the financial industry, both to keep it within the law, but also to maintain the faith, trust, and confidence of the American people in our financial system. Yes. And he, was, uh, he felt that having been an advocate for sensible financial reform, he thought there should be an organization that was a substantive counterweight um, to the lobbying of Wall Street that represented just the public interest. It wasn't talking its book. It wasn't trying to maximize revenues or profits or bonuses in a particular aspect of the industry, but just solely focused on the public interest. So Mike Masters and I founded Better Markets in the fall of 2010, months after Dodd-Frank was passed, mm -hmm. to participate in the policymaking process to try and have the law implemented to the maximum extent to protect the American people, while importantly having a robust financial system that financed the real economy. I mean, after all, I mean, a lot of people like to denigrate finance and denigrate Wall Street. But the truth is, every one of us needs a robust financial system that lends to small, medium, and large businesses, that looks at the entrepreneur and gives them money and lets them, loans them money and enables them to actually start a business, grow a business, employ people. I mean, we all need a robust financial system, but what we need is a financial system that supports the real economy rather than largely a gambling system that enriches a few thousand financiers at the expense of everybody else. There was a uh, perhaps too cynical remark made to me by a famous financier. He said, it used to be that you had to understand the world. Now what you have to understand to be a great financier is how to manipulate the government to create a one-sided bet for yourself where you get the upside and somebody else takes the downside. Well, and unfortunately, that's too much of the entire system. Now, it's looked at as a game, right? And they're gaming Washington. So that essentially, you know, heads they win, tails you lose. You know? And the Volcker Rule, named after Paul Volcker, the former head of the Fed, but the Volcker Rule basically says that banks can't use essentially taxpayer-backed deposits to place big bets that if they win, the winnings drop into the bonus pool and into the pockets of the bankers. But if they lose, like they did in 08, and they fail, the American people get the bill. Mm -hmm. And the entire system got to be, before the 08 crash, was essentially organized around enriching those financiers, letting them bet, they keep the winnings, and if there are losses, they shift them to the public. And what the Dodd-Frank law was meant to do and intended to do 
was to prevent that from happening and to, to channel those activities into lending to the real economy in a way that didn't destabilize the financial system or risk a Great Depression and a crash like 08, um, while at the, serving the needs of the American people so that we can have broad-based prosperity, so that we can reduce inequality, so that people can achieve the American dream. You, we need that. We need a robust financial system focused on those values and principles. And that's what Dodd-Frank's about. And that's, frankly, what Better Markets fights for in the regulatory process and the rulemaking process. We just do it kind of in a very detailed, substantive way. Uh, we've participated in uh, just shy of 300 rulemakings now, more than uh, really virtually anybody. I mean, even uh, the biggest trade groups uh, for Wall Street and some of the banks, as a standalone, probably more than almost anybody in 35 litigations. And what we're trying to do is make sure that the system works for the unprotected, works for the many, not just the few. The, the one guy who actually went to jail was Bernie Madoff, who ran a Ponzi scheme. He ran it for many years. He was actually, at one point, the chairman of the board of the NASDAQ exchange. So he wasn't caught. He turned himself in in December of 08. Is that right? He turned himself in because with the crash, his Ponzi scheme blew up. But, oh. but that was his activities, as bad as they were, and he deserved every day of jail time that he's still serving were completely unrelated to the recklessness, carelessness, and the illegal conduct that grew a fraudulent subprime bubble that they, Wall Street then built fraudulent, worthless derivatives on top of, that they then spread throughout the world, like embedding time bombs throughout our financial system that blew up in 08. And when you look at that, and we actually detailed better markets, you can go to our website at uh, www.bettermarkets.com and you can we put out a report called the cost of the crisis mm -hmm. and at the back of it in something like page 80 we detail you know how the crisis happened and and quote unquote who's at fault it's a complex of answers one of which is just people pursuing their incentives not trying or even thinking they're doing anything wrong and making bad decisions there are those who were reckless due to frankly, upside-down incentives. They were incentivized to be reckless, and there were plenty of people engaged in massive illegal conduct. None of them, none of them paid any of the consequences, certainly none of the ones at the top. The supervisors and the executives, to this day, are laughing all the way to the bank. And here we are, 10 years later, and they're trying to do it all over again by deregulating. At the very first INET conference, it in Cambridge, England, which I know right. you were yeah. in attendance, <clears throat> the former Italian economy and finance minister, Tommaso Padiaschilpa, mm -hmm. the late Tommaso Padiaschilpa now, gave the last talk. And he talked about a number of things, uh, one of which was that he thought there were three types of sustainability. Financial sustainability, resource sustainability, having to do with environment and climate, and social sustainability. And he said at the end that the sustainability of finance had just broken down. And he sat down after the lecture next to me and he said, and when that broke down, the threat to trust and legitimacy of governments will focus on the climate and all of it will flow into social unsustainability. Mm -hmm. About four months later, he codified that speech into what's called the Per Jacobson Lecture, which is a famous lecture given every year. And he said at one time, because of the corruption of the church in supporting the landed aristocracy, in oppressing the people, they needed to separate church and state. Mm -hmm. That there always overlaps uh, ideals, uh, ethics, moral values. But because the language of moral and ethical values in religion had been discredited through that corruption. They had to appear to be a, quote, scientific technocratic state. Mm -hmm. He thought that we were approaching now another challenge, which is not between church and state, or, or what you might call power and religion, but between wealth and the state. That the question of how the state can enhance wealth, but how wealth can influence the state and he thought that the 2008 crisis was the warning shot that wealth had become too powerful and the ex-ante supervision 
examination and enforcement had been destroyed, and that's what led to this calamity that cost so many trillions of dollars. Well, and there's no question that it's also ripped the social fabric. I mean, part of the problem is when you have a massive financial crisis, you have a, a massive economic crisis right away. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in October of 2009, 13 months after Lehman Brothers crashed, unemployment and underemployment, the so-called U6 rate in the United States, was 17.2%. Mm -hmm. 27 million Americans were either unemployed or work, forced to work part-time because they couldn't find full-time work many of them heads of households. So at the, in October of 2009, the immediate just job-related impact hit over 50 million Americans out of 309 million Americans at the time. And of course, what do you have on top of that? You have cascading problems. You have foreclosures. There were 16 million foreclosure filings in the United States follow, in the years following the financial crash. Mm -hmm. Underwater homes, where the mortgage exceeds the amount they could sell it for, shot up to 40%. The historic run rate, 1.2 percent. So this massive economic financial crash caused a massive economic crash that literally washed from coast to coast. And naturally when that happens, it manifests itself in the political process. Sure. And so the, one of the immediate manifestations of it was the Tea Party and also Occupy Wall Street, which had many overlapping um, kind of origination aspects yeah. to them, yeah. Yeah. Um, drivers to them. And then you end up, even today, when you see the election of, um, of 2016, the election of President Trump, I mean, people talk about how he promised all these things and um, what they forget. And it's, it's easy to understand why it's forgotten. But candidate Trump was the most anti-Wall Street candidate in the United States since FDR. Mm -hmm. He pilloried Clinton for being the candidate of Wall Street. He, his ads all over the place were, yeah. Goldman Sachs is going to run Washington if you elect Hillary Clinton. And the yeah. con job was President Trump has never met candidate Trump, <laughs> right? Because President Trump did everything he said Hillary Clinton was going to do, which, of course, was a lie about Hillary Clinton and, ironically, was the truth about President Trump. I mean, he basically merged the White House with Wall Street and put financiers in charge of virtually all the agencies in terms of the financial regulatory agencies. Yeah. So we're in a situation where there has been a merger of wealth, particularly financially, the financial sector wealth, and government. And it has rarely, if ever, been overlapped as much as it is right now. And we're seeing yeah. that as the protections for the vast majority of Americans are being ripped apart and they're being treated, consumers, for example, are being treated as a threat to predatory banks instead of predatory banks being a threat to consumers. Mm -hmm. So we have a dismantling of the protections largely being bought through a campaign finance system, a lobby system, and a PR influence system, which includes everything from purchased academics to um, front groups placing op-eds, uh, singing the praises that just happen yeah. to coincide uh, with their paymaster's interest. And this is where, when Trump says the system is rigged, let's just take, you said academics are paid in some instances. When you have a position in society known as an expert, <laughs> you're, you're there to what you might call help navigate. And when, what you do is marketing rather than analysis. You're, you're violating society's trust. And when they say these guys don't believe in experts, it's all fake news, etc. I don't think that that's a coincidence. Well, no, you're fr they're fraudulently exploiting people's historically justifiable reliance on experts. Yes. Because there's this it's notion. It's a complex environment. It's a complex environment. And one of the things we do at Better Markets is highlight uh, these when they come out. There was a, an op-ed in a uh, prominent... Um, periodical in Washington a couple of years ago singing the praises of the high-frequency trading industry and how, you know, it's the greatest thing, greatest innovation since who knows what. Written by a professor at one of the elite Ivy League universities. And I read it and I thought to myself, that is so one-sided, there's no way that's not purchased. So we did a little digging around and come to find out 
one of the biggest HFT firms had funded his study, not disclosed anywhere. Yep. So we picked up the phone and called the editor. Um, and in fact, to their, right away they looked into it, to their credit, uh, they ran an alternate op-ed shortly thereafter that laid out <laughs> what had happened. There. But it happens all the time. T two years ago, we were at a, uh, three years ago, we were at a congressional hearing and one of the people at the one of the members of Congress was saying, I have this Harvard study that says community banks are being killed by Dodd Frank. And why I was a little surprised. I mean, we pay attention to these things. We hadn't known there was such a big, important Harvard study. So we take a look at it. Well, it wasn't a Harvard study. Uh, it was a former, you can't make this up, J.P. Morgan Chase officer who was now at some affiliate of Harvard who wrote a paper on the front page of which says uh, Harvard and none of its affiliates endorses or has anything to do with anything written in this paper. <laughs> that was problem one with the so-called Harvard study and problem two was they blamed um, the uh, problems of community banks on Dodd-Frank uh, and they, the uh, window within which their study was conducted was January 1st of 2010 is when it began. Well, Dodd-Frank passed in July of 2010. Yeah. It was a little hard for Dodd-Frank to be hurting banks before it before was it enacted. <laughs> and it was even a even little hard before it was implemented, which took years. Yeah. So the kind of the, the fraudulent business and the gaming of the system in Washington, that's what finance really is more expert at that than, I believe, derivatives <laughs> uh, and anything else they claim expertise in. And that's one of the things we do at Better Markets. And what we try and do is meet them head on at all the regulatory agencies or wherever we can. We're pretty small um, and funded. You know, we're a pure 501c3. We're funded by, you know, public spirited people. Um, they have literally unlimited resources. There are over 30 trade groups in Washington, D.C., 30, year in and year out, that spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing nothing but promoting the interest of finance in the Washington lawmaking, policy-making process. Yeah. And when I, uh, I have to say, I worked for six years mm -hmm. in the Senate, including Senate Banking Committee, and I've worked in the private sector in finance. And as, when I, as I watch this unfolding, I see you as someone who's got technical expertise in relation to finance and law related to finance, knowledge about the money and politics system, knowledge about how public relations is used and studies are used and so forth and uh, and about the process the regulatory process the enforcement process the all the different dimensions and what concerns me is I have a lot of very well-meaning friends who open their checkbooks and give money to politicians and I guess what I would allege is if they gave money to better markets rather than politicians the leverage they would get from that would have a much greater impact than their campaign donations at this point in our republic. Well, I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that's interesting is since President Trump has been elected, there really has been a denigration and a devaluation of policy mm -hmm. and a hyper-partisanship of politics. And one of the things we see is kind of... Um, Funding and support and attention is going to what I'll call political resistance and because it's visible and it makes people feel good and there's some prospect that you have a political change. But what's happened that I find fascinating is that there's almost been an equal denigration, uh, if not completely disregard, of policy resistance, mm -hmm. which from, and as I say, I mean, I'm biased, but policy resistance is as important as political <coughs> resistance because no matter how successful one might be on the political front, once you're in power, I would think what you would want to do is have to repair as little as possible when you get there. Yeah. And so what we do is we view ourselves somewhat like um, gorillas behind enemy lines. What we're trying to do is minimize now in this current environment where there literally is a mindless deregulation mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a mindless reflexive view that if Wall Street wants it, it must be a good idea. Which, if you think about it, just 10 years ago, well, that's really, objectively that, proved bad ideas. That, 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 it's really not a contest 
for ideas that went out. It's the contest for which ideas generate the fundraising for the survival of the politician. Well, that's exactly and right. And that's yeah. why the ideas don't feel like they matter. Right. And so, but, but there really needs to be some deep thinking about the value of policy and the value of engaging in the policymaking process. And part of it is, as I said earlier, when Dodd-Frank was in the legislative process and there were these fights in the Senate and the House, literally, I mean, I was there, you know, the nightly news cameras were there. All the big reporters were there from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal covering every back and forth and what's happening here. What about that amendment? What were those eight words and what is this? And then the law passes and there's a big signing in the White House, all great visuals for TV and the media. And then as soon as that happened, they moved on. But, what, but, but that's actually when the real work happens because it then moves into the agencies where nobody understands the rulemaking process. They don't understand the agency process. They don't understand... To, to turn a phrase, they don't understand how a law becomes real rather than how a bill, they got the bill becomes a law part, but how the law becomes real in the world yeah. to either protect the American people, to protect the financial system, to prevent great depressions, or how they protect the profits and revenues of the biggest actors in finance. That part of the story gets almost no attention. Mm -hmm. That's where the lobbyists and the lawyers and the campaign finance and the special interests excel. Yes. And that's where we live. I mean, we're there on the other side. Um, but as you say correctly, a lot of the, you know, almost all the money's going to the political side and not to the policy side. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're there shedding light on these things. And uh, it certainly is a troubled time in terms of the quality of governance, the quality of faith in governance. And as Stephen Brill said in his book, Tailspin, there are a few good guys out there. And he profiled you in his book. So uh, how would I say thank you and keep up the good work? Well, thank you. Thanks nice for talking to you, Rob. You too.